A very good morning to all of you from uh, Dharma College and uh, especially to Venerable uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh, we're delighted to start. Uh, it's 10 o'clock here in um, Pacific Coast time in Berkeley, California, where I am um, currently situated at Dharma College. Uh, this is a series of talks that we've been having uh, for the last four months, uh, Wisdom Talks. For modern times and we are delighted to invite all of you welcome you into this uh, zoom uh, retreat um, and the retreat is called from amidama perspective and understanding of mind the retreat will start today and will end tomorrow um, just a little bit about dharma college we are based here in berkeley California in the heart of downtown Berkeley. And we were established about 10 years ago by my father, Venerable Tartung Tuku, who came to the United States in the late 60s um, and has been very prolific in um, transmitting these teachings, especially to the East by reprinting many of the texts that were lost in the Tibetan libraries. Um, so that's been a very big effort from the Tibetan Mingma Meditation Center. And alongside Dharma College, there are about 17 other organizations that he established. So Dharma College is one of its uh, most recent offerings. And really what we try to do here is to bring these teachings uh, into modern conditions so that we can translate them into our everyday living and it's a great honor to have Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi today sharing with us an understanding of mind from the Abhidhamma perspective. Um, many of our courses at Dharma College um, have to do with mind and self. And we invite all of you into these classes if you are interested. Um, we'll be sharing with you the link um, in the chat box. So just a little bit about how the retreat will go. Um, we start from this morning till noon. Uh, so the first session will be two hours and then we will have a break and we will return back at two to four. That's Pacific Coast time. East Coast time, that would be five to 7 p.m. Um, so the morning session will be from 10 to noon and then we will have a break, a lunch break and then come back here at two o'clock uh, to four. Um, and the same schedule will um, hold for tomorrow. We'll start again at 10 o'clock and finish at noon. And then we will have a break and then complete um, from two to four tomorrow. Um, we have a couple people on, on here with Dharma College as their logo. If there are any technical questions that you have, um, feel free to um, send a specific message to the Dharma College logo. Um, we'll try to assist you if there's any technical issues. Um, you can also send us an email to registrar at dharma-college.com and we'll try to assist you if there's something that's coming up for you um, in this retreat. Now I'd like to um, share a little bit about um, our guest uh, today. A great honor to have Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, many of you already know him because you may have taken retreats with him, but those of you who do not, I'd like to take this opportunity to share a little bit about his background and why we are so privileged today to hear and to receive these teachings. Um, so Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi is an American Buddhist monk, originally from New York City. After living as a monk in Sri Lanka for 24 years, he now resides at Chong Yen Monastery in Carmel, New York. Yeah. Ven uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi is a prolific writer of Buddhist essays and books. He has translated and commented extensively on the Pali suttas, including complete translations of the Majjhima Nikaya and the Samyutta Nikaya and the Anguttara Nikaya. And in 2008, he founded the Buddhist Global Relief, a nonprofit organization that provides relief from poverty and hunger 
among impoverished communities worldwide. And so um, those of you who would like to make a dano or an offering, um, I would uh, ask you to make a donation directly to this uh, foundation called the Buddhist Global Relief. We'll have more information in the chat box, um, but this is a really wonderful organization. And if anyone chooses to make an offering, they can do so um, by clicking on that link, which we'll have in the um, chat box. Um, I did send an email to everyone uh, with an attachment of the comprehensive manual of Abhidhamma. So if you did not receive that, just send me a little message in the chat box and I will try to get that to you with your email. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to also introduce my husband who is also assisting me alongside. Uh, and his name is Dr. Richard Dixie. And I'd like to just um, have him say a few words before we welcome our guest speaker today. Well, hello everyone. There's not much to add really. Just to say that, you know, if you've got questions, I'm going to collate them from the chat box. So just put them in the chat. I'll cut them into a file. Of course, the venerable won't have time to answer questions from 200 people, but we'll try and, uh, you know, select the ones that seem most relevant. Please, we, we want to concentrate on the Abhidhamma. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not personal questions, but questions about the Abhidhamma would be welcome. <laughs> and uh, we would, uh, we'll try and get them and we'll have a Q&A after every session. So, you know, just put them in the chat box and I'll cut them into a file and give them to Wamo, who will ask them to the venerable. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Richard. And just finally, I wanted to, I missed out that um, these uh, teachings will be recorded. And so we will be able to send them to you at the end of the retreat. Just give us a few days so we can do a little bit of editing mm -hmm. and we'll make sure that we send out a full set of the recordings for this retreat. This is also being um, taped on Facebook Live on my personal Facebook of Wang Mo Dixie. Um, so I will be able to also share that immediately after this retreat, if you wanted to receive that. But um, now I'd like to turn it over to Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. It's our real great honor and with deep mm. respect that we invite you into this mm. retreat. Thank you. Okay, so, so first I want to thank Wang Mo and Richard and Dharma College for inviting me to give this little mini retreat over this weekend. And I'm going to be speaking about the perspective on the mind in the Theravada Abhidhamma system. I'm not going to go into a detailed explanation of the background of the Abhidharma, but just to say that the Abhidharma is a particular approach to the interpretation and explanation of the Buddha's teachings which developed over a period of maybe 300 years, 400 years after the passing away of the Buddha. And it aims at what I would call a technical, systematic presentation of the teachings of the Buddha, developing them, bringing out maybe implications that were inherent in the original teachings and unifying the different aspects of the teaching into a very broad and comprehensive overarching system. And the focus of the Theravada Abhidhamma is in fact the mind itself. And in focusing on the mind, we could say that the Abhidhamma is developing strains of thought that are already quite clearly enunciated in the Buddha's original teachings. And I'm going to now share the screen. Let me just close down some windows. Screen sharing has failed to start the window you select. I see, okay. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes, yes Bhante. Okay. 
Okay, so I just took some passages from the Nikayas. It's the collection of the suttas or discourses of the Buddha to show the importance that the Buddha ascribes to the mind. So here's some sayings from the Ankutara Nikaya, the Book of Ones. The Buddha says he sees no thing which when undeveloped leads to such great harm as the mind and no thing which when developed leads to such great good as the mind. Again, nothing, no other thing that when untamed, unguarded, unprotected, and unrestrained leads to such great harm as the mind. Nothing that when tamed, guarded, protected, and restrained leads to such great good as the mind. And then within the practice of Buddhist meditation, a major focus point is on understanding the mind itself through close-up observation of the workings of one's own mind. And we could see this brought out quite clearly in the Satipatthana Sutta, the discourse on the foundations of mindfulness, where one of the foundations of mindfulness is contemplating the mind. And here the Buddha explains how to practice this. Here, the monk or the practitioner understands a mind connected with lust as connected with lust, a mind freed from lust as freed from lust, and so with hatred and with delusion. And then the end point of the Buddha's, of the Buddha's path, one could say, is the liberated mind. So we start off with the mind in bondage, bound way down by the defilements of lust, hate, and delusion. And then the goal or the final point of the teaching is the liberated mind. So here is the mind liberated from the taint of sensual desire, liberated from the taint of craving for existence, liberated from the taint of ignorance. And so we could see that we call this the central point of focus for the Buddha's teaching is the mind and the development of the Buddha's teaching is a progression from the fettered, defiled, constricted mind to the liberated, purified, unbound mind. And so when the Abhidhamma takes the mind as its starting point and its focus, it's really developing in great detail a particular focus on the mind already that we can already discover in the Buddha's original teachings preserved in the suttas. But what the Abhidhamma does, the way I would describe this is that it applies a kind of contemplative microscope to examine at an extremely fine and subtle level the workings of the mind. And this leads to a certain maybe change in the understanding of the nature of the mind. Like in the discourses or suttas, when the mind is spoken of, it's always spoken of in the singular, the mind almost as if the mind were a persisting entity, even though the mind is always changing, arising and passing away, associated with different mental states, but the mind is spoken of as though it's a single entity. What the Abhidhamma does is to apply this microscope and to show that what we call the mind in ordinary discourse is actually a sequence, a series of fleeting, instantaneous acts of mind. And so the word that is used to represent mind, the word in Pali is the same word in in Sanskrit. The word is chitta. And so in the sutta teaching, chitta is spoken of in the singular as the mind. But in the Abhidhamma, we speak about a series of chittas, a sequence of chittas, 
which succeed one another with incredible speed. So that it's said that within the time it takes to snap the fingers, hundreds of chittas arise and pass away. And this understanding of the instantaneous nature of the mind must have been disclosed in the process of mindfulness meditation, where as you're observing the mind with very intense focused mindfulness, one sees how states of mind are arising and passing with great rapidity. Okay, as the teachers of the Abhidhamma, the formulators of the Abhidhamma look into this sequence of momentary cheetahs arising and passing away, they found that the, but before I come to this, let me go back a little bit. and come to the explanation of what is a chitta. Can you see the text? Now I'm bringing up the text of the manual of Abhidhamma. Yes, Bhante. Okay. Yes, Bhante. Okay. Okay, so the commentaries, the commentators, they explain chitta in three ways. First, as agent, as instrument, and then is activity. So we say the as the agent, the chitta is that which cognizes, which knows, or which experiences an object. So here we have in Pali, aramanang chintetiti chitta. So that's one way to look at the mind as the agent that knows the object. Another way to look at the mind is as the agent uh, as the instrument by which one knows the object. So in this case, we say it's etena chintenti ti chitta. So the mind is that by which one knows the object. But the third explanation, which is the one taken to be most satisfactory, is to take the chitta as being nothing other than the process or the act of knowing or cognizing the object. So in Pali, this is chintana matang chitta. So it's not that the chitta is something distinct from the act of cognizing, but the chitta is the act of cognizing itself. So it's a process of knowing an object, a process that occurs very quickly, just in a snap of a finger, then it's gone, followed by the next momentary act of cognizing, and then the next, the next, and the next. Okay, as the formulators of the Abhidhamma investigated the cheetahs that make up the series, they found that the cheetahs can be divided into two broad categories, two broad classes. Okay, one, if we use the Pali word viti chitta. So this means and I'm going to be constantly using the word chitta to signify this act of mind or occasion of mind. It's a more convenient expression term to use than having constantly to use the rather clumsy act of mind or occasion of mind. So we have viti chitta. So these are chittas that occur within an active cognitive process, an active process by which one is cognizing an object that is appearing either to one of the physical senses or inwardly through reflection, introspection, mental internal examination. And these chaitas occur in a fixed process, an active process by which one runs through the object, comes to know it 
and to process it in a particular way. The other type of chitta is called viti muta chitta. So these are chittas, acts of mind that occur outside of an active cognitive process. So these are chittas that pertain, I would call this, to the base level of consciousness within a given life. Or maybe you call this the substratum level of, of the mind or consciousness. So whenever the mind is not engaged in an active cognitive process, it drops down into this base level of mental activity or substratum mental activity. And so in the course of our waking life, the mind is constantly alternating back and forth between active cognitive processes, the viti chittas, and then dropping down into the subliminal state or substratum level, the chittas outside the cognitive process. I don't want to overload with Pali expressions, but this is almost unavoidable. So within our life, this kind of chitta that's occurring outside the cognitive process is known by the expression bhavanga. Which might be translated, some translators have used life continuum. It, when I explain it, I prefer to use the substratum consciousness or substratum mind or base level mind. So this is the passive subliminal flow of mind outside the cognitive process. And in our waking life, the mind is constantly alternating back and forth. So one moment an object is impinging on the senses and then we're engaged in active cognitive processes, processing that object. Then when the processing of the object is finished, the mind will drop momentarily to the level of the bhavanga. Then another object appears and the mind emerges from the bhavanga into the active mode. So it's swinging back and forth between active mode and passive mode. And we could see the bhavanga most clearly, though we, in a way we don't see it, but it appears most clearly in deep dreamless sleep. So when you go to sleep and then there's no dreams, and one is just completely, there seems to be no apparent object at all. From the standpoint of the Abhidhamma, we would say that the mind has dropped into the bhavanga. But even in the course of our waking life, the mind is always constantly dropping into the bhavanga and coming out, dropping in, coming out. But it's going, it's occurring so quickly that we don't even recognize this drop into the bhavanga and the coming out of it. It's a little bit like what they tell me, some of my technical friends, when we're looking at the computer screen, they say that the comp computer screen, hundreds of times a second, it's flashing into, it's going blank and then reappearing, going blank, reappearing. But when I'm reading the text on the screen, I don't see the going blank. I just see a continuous screen. And so it seems to us that the mind is continuously in an active mode, but according to the Abhidhamma teaching, the mind is constantly going into the bhavanga and coming back out into, into the active mode of cognition. Okay, now the teachers of the, or the formulators of the Abhidhamma have organized the chittas, these momentary acts of cognition into particular, according to certain principles of classification. So there are two primary 
schemes of classification, each of which is fourfold. And these two schemes intersect to give us the vast diversity of types of cheetahs found in the Abhidhamma system. So the first scheme of classification is the distinction of cheetahs according to the plane of consciousness. And so there are four planes of consciousness. Three of these are mundane. The sense sphere plane, the fine material, or, or, yeah, the sense sphere, the fine material sphere, and the immaterial sphere. And then the fourth plane is known as the Lokutara, the world transcending or super mundane sphere. Now, if you know anything about Buddhist cosmology, the Buddhist picture of the universe, you'll, sit, you'll know that these first three planes of consciousness correspond to the three planes of existence in the Buddhist cosmos. And let's just take a quick picture of the Buddhist cosmos. Okay, so I have a table here that shows us We have the sense sphere plane with the lower realms of existence, the hells, animal realm, and so on. Then there are seven fortunate sense sphere realms, the human realm and the realms of the six sense sphere heavens. And then above the sense sphere realm, there is the fine material plane with many divisions corresponding to the four jhanas. And then above the fine materials plane is the immaterial plane consisting of four very, very subtle refined planes of existence in which there's no material form at all. Now these are planes of existence and there's a connection between the planes of consciousness or spheres of consciousness and the planes of existence, but the two are not identical, but rather what we say is that the plane of consciousness is the type of consciousness or types of cheetahs which are typical of that of the corresponding plane of existence. So the spheres of consciousness, these are categories for classifying the types of cheetahs, whereas the planes of existence are the realms of existence into which beings are reborn and in which they pass their lives. But still, there is a close connection between the spheres of consciousness and the planes of existence in that a particular plane of consciousness comprises those types of consciousness that are typical of the corresponding plane of existence. They're the types of consciousness that we could say tend to hang out in that plane of existence. But a, a, state, a cheta of a particular plane is not tied down to the corresponding plane of existence, but a type of cheetah of a particular sphere might arise in other planes of existence. For example,
we have a human being who is a meditator and attains, let us say, the first jhana. Now, the first jhana, that meditative absorption, consists of a series of chittas, which are called fine material sphere chittas. So those are the types of chittas that are typical of beings living in the fine material plane of existence corresponding to the first jhana. So when a human being enters into the first jhana, they will be experiencing chittas that are fine material sphere chittas, chittas typical of the fine material realm of existence. And if the meditator goes beyond the jhanas and attains the immaterial or formless meditative absorptions, they will be experiencing in that absorption, they'll be experiencing the immaterial sphere chittas, the chittas that are typical of the immaterial plane of existence. So the plane of existence gives its name to the types of chittas that are typical of that plane of existence. But human beings can experience the chittas of, of the multiple planes of existence, even while living within this human body. And the beings in those other planes of existence, for example, the beings in the fine material plane, in the Brahm, what they call the Brahma world, can have chittas that are dominated by greed or by wrong views. Those chittas are sense sphere chittas. They're chittas typical of the sense sphere plane of existence, but those chittas will be experienced by these beings in the fine material plane of existence. There's also another connection between the chittas of the particular spheres and the planes of existence in that the karmically active chittas of a particular sphere generate karma that tends to lead to rebirth in the corresponding plane of existence. So as human beings, if we generate, say, heavy, unwholesome states of mind, unwholesome chittas, those unwholesome chittas tend to lead to rebirth in the realm of misery, in the sensory plane of existence. If we create ordinary meritorious types of chittas, those chittas tend to generate rebirth in the fortunate realm, <coughs> realms within the sense sphere. If we attain the jhanas, those chittas tend to lead to rebirth in the fine material plane of existence. And if we attain the formless or immaterial meditative absorptions, those chittas create the karma that tends to lead to rebirth in the formless or immaterial plane of existence. Okay, so those are the, th we have the three mundane planes of consciousness or spheres of consciousness. And then the fourth sphere of consciousness is called the supramundane or lokutara. The word lokutara comes from the word loka meaning world and uttara beyond or transcending. So in the highest sense, that which transcends the world of conditioned phenomena is the unconditioned element, nibbana or nirvana, 
And then the chittas, the states of consciousness that bring about the realization of Nibbana are called the Lokutara chittas, super mundane consciousness. And as we'll see, these include four types of consciousness called the four world transcending paths. And those four paths have their corresponding four corresponding states called the four world transcending fruits. We'll be coming to this in more detail later. Okay, so I said that there are two fourfold schemes for classifying the chittas. So the first scheme is by way of planes of chittas, planes of, of consciousness. The second scheme is by way of kind or nature, particularly the ethical nature of the chitta or state of consciousness. So in this scheme, the chittas are divided into four classes. So we have the unwholesome, the wholesome, the resultant, and the functional. And so the unwholesome cheetahs, so these will be cheetahs, states of mind that are accompanied by one or another of the three unwholesome roots, greed, hatred, and delusion. In contrast, the wholesome states of consciousness, these are cheetahs that are accompanied by the wholesome roots, non-greed, non-hatred, and non-delusion, which more positively can be represented as generosity, kindness, and wisdom. So those are the first two classes, unwholesome and wholesome. And those are the chittas that create karma. So from the Abhidhamma point of view, what creates karma are particular chittas, and those chittas have an ethical significance. The unwholesome chittas create unwholesome or harmful karma, undesirable karma. And the wholesome chittas create beautiful or wholesome karma, karma that will lead to fortunate results. Okay, then when these chittas that create karma bring about, when the karma brings about its results, those results are also chittas or states of consciousness. And the chittas or states of consciousness that arise through the ripening of karma are called the resultants. The Pali word is vipaka, which means literally the ripening. So we could say that karma is like a seed. It's like de depositing seeds in the ground. So we create the karma that deposits these seeds in the process of the mind. And when those seeds ripen, they bring about their results, the vipaka. And those results are states of consciousness or chitas. And so we have results of wholesome karma and results of unwholesome karma, both grouped together under the heading of the resultants. Okay, then the fourth class of, of the chittas, when divided by way of the nature, this is called the Pali word is kiriya or kriya, which means literally action or activity. And here, just seeking an English word for it, I followed some earlier translators using functional. And so this is a type of consciousness or a type of chitta, which is neither karmically constructive nor a karmic resultant, yet it involves some kind of activity. So it's activity that doesn't generate karma and that does not experience the results of karma. 
we'll see what the what the functional types of chitta are as we go along. And so both the resultants and the functional chittas, in terms of karma, are neither wholesome nor unwholesome. So they're classified as indeterminate or unclassifiable by way of these two categories, wholesome and unwholesome. That is, they can't be determined as either wholesome or unwholesome. And then just to jump to see some, whoops, we have some tables which show the schemes of the chitas laid out. Okay, so this, is, this table whoops, gives a broad overview of cheetahs by plane. And so we have 81 that are mundane. We're going to come to the different types, but just looking over, getting the broad view, we see sense fear cheetahs, which can be unwholesome, rootless, and beautiful. And then the sublime, which includes the fine material sphere and the immaterial sphere cheetahs, and then the super mundane cheetahs. So that's classification by the plane of the cheetahs. We'll see the 89 cheetahs as we go along. And then by way of the 89 cheetahs by kind, we have the unwholesome, the wholesome, then the indeterminate, which are resultants and the functionals. The numbers at this point will not make, have much meaning until we go through them. Okay, maybe perhaps I should take, the matter of taking questions is a little tricky because a lot of the material that might come up in the questions might be answered as I go through, but perhaps I should just take a few questions just to see if there's anything unclear in what um, I covered so far with the two overlapping or intersecting schemes fourfold schemes for classifying the cheetahs. Thank you, Bhante. I'm going to um, hand over to Richard because he's been collecting the questions in the chat box. And maybe if you could release the unsharing, then we can uh, go back to the gallery view. But uh, Richard, I'm going to hand over to you for um, the questions related to what we've just gone through. Well, yes, Bhante, there are some questions. Um, so let me just run through them. The first one is this: um, is with with vimutta with vitimutta chitta happening at the substrate levels, subliminal states? Are we speaking here of the subpersonal or the unconscious mind? Is would that be a fair referent for this idea, the idea of the unconscious mind that we have in Western psychology? It might correspond roughly to the unconscious, to the idea of the unconscious. So there would probably be very vast sort of conceptual differences between the two, but we could say sort of broad, in a very broad way that the bhavanga or the substrate of mind is occurring below the threshold of conscious awareness. Okay, then yeah. there's a couple of questions about cheetah. Um, the first one is this, if cheetah is defined as knowing, how can it change from one sphere to another? Surely knowing has no characteristics. No, it, it, it knows the object. So the object of the cheetah is going to differ. And the whole, there'll be, a, the cheetah is constituted by a complex of mental factors as we're going to see tomorrow. So as one cheetah is replaced by another, it's, the cheetahs that succeed each other 
they might be knowing a different object or they might be knowing the same object, but with a different constellation of mental factors and with different functions. The chaitas have different, in a general way, they have the broadest function is to know the object, but within that broad category of knowing the object, each chitta has a more, a narrower and more specific function. And I'm going to come to some of these functions as we go along. Oh, we'll leave that then till tomorrow. Yeah. The, the third one is this, if cheetah is knowing, how can we know dreamless sleep? If we cannot know dreamless sleep, how do we know it exists? <laughs> I think that question doesn't really, to answer that question doesn't really depend on any reference to the Buddhist Abhidhamma system. We could just raise that question in regard to our own, when we wake up, and we say, wow, I was asleep without any dreams. How do we know that we had a dreamless sleep? <laughs> Somehow we know it. I don't know how. <laughs> so is there, is, is there knowing beyond the cheetah then in this system? Would there be, I mean, who knows the cheetah? I mean, <laughs> no, the, the cheetah itself is the knowing. Yeah. There can be, maybe call this reflexive cheetah. The cheetah, this would occur only when we're awake where we reflect back and we know what's going on within the chitta. But in dreamless sleep, I guess it's just that one wakes up and one knows that one was asleep and didn't have a dream. Right, okay, thank you, Bandy. Then the fourth one is this, and I know this comes up later, so you probably wanna go on to it, but could you explain the process by which cheetahs uh, produce karma? That is something that I think we will be coming to, so. Right. And then the fifth one here, there's some questions in the chat box, since I've been talking. Um, it says here, how similar is the Theravada Abhidhamma to the one studied in the Tibetan tradition, like the Abhidhamma Kosha or the Abhidhamma Samakaya? Um, um, I think that would be like a topic for a university, six, a four, a six, <laughs> maybe a four month course in comparative <laughs> Abhidhamma systems. And I'm not all that familiar with the Abhidhamma Kosha system. Okay, then the second one is, is it absolutely necessary to study the Abhidhamma to practice Buddha Dharma for a lay person? No. <laughs> and then here's another one from a yeah, I, I, I say that it's, it's a useful field of study to get some understanding of the nature of the mind and then material phenomena in order to get, I would call a detailed, in-depth perspective on those topics but to be able to practice Buddhism, even to reach, I would say, stages of deep realization. In my opinion, it's not necessary to study the detailed technicalities of the Abhidhamma. Thank you, Bhante. Um, from a historical perspective, did the Buddha teach what is in the Abhidhamma or was this developed later after the Buddha passed away? Yeah, you know, sort of the orthodox Theravada position is that the Buddha taught the Abhidhamma, but the position of what he called contemporary critical scholarship is that the Abhidhamma developed over a period of maybe a, a few hundred years until it crystallized well in different Abhidhamma systems. One is the Theravada Abhidhamma system. The other, which developed in Northern India, became the Abhidhamma of the Savastivada system. And probably there were several other Abhidhamma systems which didn't survive. Thank you, Bhante. That's all the questions. Okay, okay, that's good. Okay, so now we're going to move into the specifics of the types of cheetahs. So let me go back into sharing mode. Can you make the text bigger, please? Oh, the text bigger. Okay. You make it full screen, Bounty, the actual text, and it might be better. Okay, let me find my place for this. Is this better? It doesn't look bigger to me. Is this better? Not really. Not really. Okay, let me go back and then make the text bigger. 
we could see it. Perhaps the font size can increase. Yeah, there we are. Like that. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Okay. Okay, so we're going to be sort of ascending, climbing the ladder of cheetah, sort of starting at the bottom and then working our way from the lowest to the, to the highest. And so we start with the sense sphere consciousness. So these are the cheetahs which are typical of the sense sphere, which the cheetahs that sort of hang out in the sense sphere. And the first class of these are the unwholesome cheetahs. And these are cheetahs which are rooted, could be rooted in the unwholesome roots of greed, hatred, and or delusion. I'm not going to go through the individual classes. This, you have the book that, which was sent along with the, with the announcement of the course. But I'm going to go through the modes of explaining these classifications. Okay, now it's important to understand when we take these three roots according to the Abhidhamma system, greed and hatred are mutually exclusive. That is, they cannot coexist within the same chitta. You know, it might seem to us that when I'm greedy, say there's a piece of pie on the table and I'm reaching for that piece of pie because I like that pie and somebody else sticks his hand out first and takes it. Then I get angry and get, feel resentful towards him. It might seem to me that my greed and my anger or hatred are present simultaneously. But according to, to the Abhidhamma way of of analysis, because the cheetahs are occurring, succeeding each other so quickly, what's happening is that the cheetahs rooted in greed are occurring on one occasion, and those occurring that are accompanied by hatred are occurring on a different occasion, but in very close proximity to each other. Because greed and hatred pull in different directions so greed, the nature of greed is to reach out, to grab and to pull towards oneself. The nature of hatred is to push away or to try to abolish or destroy as we saw a few days ago <laughs> on full display, okay. <laughs> Okay, so greed and hatred mutually exclusive. <laughs> but the third unwholesome root, which is oops. the third unwholesome root is delusion. And delusion is present in every state of unwholesome consciousness. So Cheetahs rooted in greed and those rooted in hatred always have delusion along with them as an underlying root. But there are certain types of certain cheetahs in which delusion arises unaccompanied by greed or hatred. So those cheetahs are said to be cheetahs involving sheer delusion or cheetahs rooted in delusion. And so we start off with the cheetahs rooted in greed. And in this Abhidhamma system, there are eight cheetahs rooted in greed. And they are distinguished according to three principles of distinction, three kinds of dichotomy or bifurcation of the cheetahs. Okay, the first principle, the first dichotomy is by way of the feeling that accompanies the cheetah. So a cheetah that's rooted in greed 
can be accompanied by a feeling either of pleasure or happiness. Here is called joy. Or a feeling, and I'm not so happy with this, but I follow along. The Pali word is upeka. which is here translated as equanimity. Now the word upeka, sometimes and usually in the Buddhist text, it means equanimity as a balanced state of mind where the mind is not uplifted by attachment or cast down by aversion, but is balanced, poised, steady unruffled. But here the word upeka really means simply neutral feeling. So it's not that desirable quality of equanimity, but it's just an indifferent feeling, a neutral feeling, not ha happy, not sad. So maybe better to have rendered this as neutral feeling. And so some states of mind, some chitas accompanied by greed, have a pleasant feeling or joy, others just this neutral feeling here called equanimity. So that's the first principle of distinction, the feeling. The second principle of distinction is whether that state accompanied by greed includes a wrong view or does not include a wrong view. And for some reason, in the Abhidhamma, um, the Theravada Abhidhamma system, wrong view is, occurs always in states of mind that are accompanied by greed. This seems to us, it seems somewhat counterintuitive, maybe because of the way we understand wrong view. Like for example, maybe people in the society have the, have the view, okay, all Muslims are terrorists or at least sus sus suspect of being terrorists. So that we would say is a wrong view, which seems to us to be accompanied or rooted in hatred. But this is my opinion, that the Abhidhamma is developing the system of classification. It's not with the intention to develop an all comprehensive, totally adequate scheme for explaining every possible state of mind, but rather that the Abhidhamma is developed on the basis of the specific concerns of the Buddha's teaching emerging from within the context of ancient Indian ascetic or contemplative culture. And so the types of wrong views that they would be countering would be the views held by the non the communities of the non-Buddhist philosophers, ascetics, and meditative systems, which were aiming at some kind of eternal existence in the Brahma world or some other higher realm of existence. Or for those who wanted to delight in sensual pleasures, the wrong view that this life is our only life, and so we should enjoy ourselves to the utmost by indulging the senses. But if we take a, a contemporary view of, or contemporary perspective on all the different types of wrong view, I think we would have to make some revisions in the scheme of cheetahs in the Abhidhamma. So I think we have to remember this when we say that wrong view in the Abhidhamma arises only in cheetahs accompanied by greed. But states of greed, states, cheetahs accompanied by greed do not necessarily have wrong view. So wrong view might be present, might be absent. Okay, then the third principle of distinction is whether 
the chitta is prompted or unprompted. And I'm going to come to some more explanation of this as we go along. Okay, so what is meant by joy? So joy is a pleasant mental feeling. So pleasant feelings are said, are said to be of two kinds, bodily pleasant feeling, when we experience a pleasant touch sensation and a pleasant mental feeling when we think of something pleasant, when we enjoy maybe a beautiful scenery, hear some pleasant, beautiful music, and then a state of delight arises in the mind. So that would be so manasa, a feeling of joy. And then the, so four chitas are accompanied by this joyful or pleasant feeling. And then four chitas are accompanied by that neutral feeling here called equanimity. So remember, this is not that lofty spiritual quality of mental balance or impartiality, but it's simply neutral feeling, the a feeling that's neither gladness nor dejection. Okay, then wrong view, we've already gone through. Okay, then we come to this distinction by way of being prompted or unprompted. And so what is meant by prompting? And the Pali word that's used here is sankara, but being used in a special sense to mean prompting or sometimes instigation or inducement. So prompting occurs when we might be instigated by others. For example, okay, somebody says, let's go out to get some ice cream. And I don't really want to make the trip, but they say, come, 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 don't be a, a duller, don't be a, a, what's the expression, a killjoy, come along and let's go get some ice cream. And so then I said, okay, I'll go get some ice cream. And while we're driving to the ice cream shop, then I start thinking about the ice cream and my mouth starts watering and I can't even wait to get to the ice cream shop. So though in that case, the states of greed have been arising because of prompting by others. Or it could originate from within myself. So Okay, so I'm walking past the ice cream shop and I think, well, I should be trying to lose some weight. But then I walk a few yards past the ice cream shop and then images start coming into the mind of a cup of chocolate ice cream or vanilla fudge ice cream. And then I start telling myself, come on, man, you could lose weight tomorrow. <laughs> but don't pass up this opportunity. And so I convince myself now to go and get some of the ice cream. So in that case, I'm prompting myself, instigating myself to indulge my craving for ice cream. So that is a prompted state of mind. And then the opposite of that would be a state, a chitta that arises spontaneously without prompting, without inducement, either by others or by myself. And so that is called the unprompted chitta. And so when you take these four principles of distinction and mesh them together, then we get eight types of chittas rooted in greed.
Okay, now we come to the next type of unwholesome chitta. These are the chittas rooted in hatred. And for some reason, the Abhidhamma system uses, it doesn't use the word dosa, the usual word for hatred, but in classifying it uses a synonym. The word used here is patika, which means, this is what I translate as aversion, but it's basically the same thing as hatred. And we could say that the chitas rooted in hatred are of only two types. There's one which is unprompted and the one which is prompted. And you can see that both of these chitas are accompanied by displeasure, by unpleasant mental feeling. So consciousness rooted in hatred arises with only one kind of feeling that is displeasure. The Pali word is domanasa. So it's the opposite of somanasa. So it's an unpleasant mental feeling, a painful mental feeling. And it's said within the Abhidhamma system that chitas rooted in hatred do not arise in association with wrong view. But in my opinion, in my view, this would be something that we would have to maybe revise if we were to, to be developing an all comprehensive um, understanding of possible states of mind. And what's interesting is that whenever a state of mind accompanied by hatred, anger, irritation, resentment arises, it's always accompanied by an unpleasant feeling. And I think we could see this if we examine our own mind when we are angry, upset, displeased with something or resentful towards something. The feeling is always one of, it's always an unpleasant feeling. Even if you strike out and you hit, maybe you get angry and you bang your fist against the wall and you feel some release and some pleasure. But when you're actually angry, the mind is accompanied by this unpleasant mental feeling. And then the word rendered as aversion or hatred includes all degrees of aversion. So when we use the English word hatred, we usually think of a rather violent, forceful, potentially aggressive emotion arising in the mind. But the word patiga could, covers a very broad range of states of aversion, ra ranging from violent rage to even a subtle irritation. Okay, then we have the chitas. And remember, in these, all of these chitas rooted in greed and rooted in hatred or aversion, delusion is also present, but it's present in the background, sort of hidden under the surface. Now, in these two types of chitas, delusion comes out into the open. Here it becomes more prominent. Maybe it's a little bit like if, to use an analogy, during the summer, I might be sitting here and there are crickets outside which will be chirping very, very loudly. But if I'm watching, say, the evening news on my computer, I'm just following the news reporter reporting what's going on. And I don't even hear the crickets chirping but if I turn off the computer or I turn off the, the news program and I just am reading text, then I hear the crickets chirping outside. But it doesn't mean that when I turn off the news program that the crickets start chirping, but the crickets have been chirping all along, but they've just been drowned out by the sound of the news program. But when I turn off the news program, 
then I hear the crickets which were chirping all along. So now delusion has been present all along. But when there's neither greed nor hatred in the mind, th then in certain cheetahs, the delusion becomes more prominent. So these are the two cheetahs rooted in delusion, in prominent delusion. So one, and both of these cheetahs are said to be accompanied by equanimity, by that neutral feeling, neither pleasant nor painful feeling. So one cheetah is the cheetah that's associated with doubt. And this is the way this is always interpreted in the Abhidhamma, that this is a kind of skeptical doubt about the Buddha, his teaching about the Sangha, the Aryan Sangha, and about the training or the path laid out by the Buddha. So that's the chitta accompanied by doubt. And then there's another kind of chitta that's rooted in delusion, which is the chitta that's associated with restlessness. Now, restlessness too, as I think we'll see tomorrow, is present in all the unwholesome cheetahs. Restlessness is invariably present in every unwholesome cheetah. But again, in the states with greed and aversion, the restlessness is hidden in the background. And even when there's doubt, then restlessness is in the background. But there are certain cheetahs that become prominent when there's no greed, no hatred, no doubt, and then the mind is just agitated, restless, unstable, unsteady. So that would be the chitta associated with restlessness. So those are the two chittas rooted in delusion. Yeah, I say here in the notes that the mental factor of restlessness is found in all 12 unwholesome cheetahs. But in the other 11 cheetahs, its force is relatively weak and its function is secondary. But in this last type of cheetah, restlessness becomes the chief factor. And so for that reason, this cheetah is described as the cheetah associated with restlessness. Uh, here are some examples, some illustrations. Okay, so we have eight types of, eight cheetahs rooted in greed. Okay, so with a feeling of joy, holding the view that there is no evil in stealing, a boy spontaneously steals an apple from the fruit stall at the market. Again, with joy, holding the same view, he steals the apple because a friend persuades him to do that, to do so. And then in three and four, the boy does the same without a wrong view. And in cases, cheetahs five to eight, everything is the same, except he does this with a neutral feeling, not with a feeling of joy. Then the two types rooted in hatred. So here we have one man murders another, in a spontaneous fit of rage. And in the second case, one man murders another after premeditation. So that is prompted, or he might be convinced to do so by somebody else. Maybe should we take a five minute breather? <laughs> Pante? Yes, Pante. Yeah. Yes, maybe that would be good is to take a little uh, five minutes and we'll return. Yeah, but because I'm told that this material can make people's minds get restless. <laughs> 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 
We also have some questions, Bhante. So maybe uh, when we come back after our five minute break, we can uh, go into a few questions, if that's okay. Or should we wait till we? Um, okay, maybe at that point, then it's best that we take a few questions. Wonderful. Well, we're going to start back up again. And um, if it's all right with you, Bante, we'll take a few questions. Uh, and Richard's uh, been collecting a few in the chat box. So I'll turn it over to Richard. Hello, Bante. Let's just see. Is it, I wonder if everyone's back. I hope they all are. I can't see how many people are online. So can you hear me, Bante? Yeah. We can hear you, Richard. I just want to check the Bantic can hear me. I think he's maybe muted. Oh, he's not muted. Okay. So Banti, can we ask some questions? Oh, he has to put oh. on. Yes, great. So Banti, can we ask some questions? Yeah, I just want to do something first. Okay, no just problem. Yeah. Try to get two versions of this manual so that I can switch back and forth the diagrams. Ah, okay. Okay. So Bhante, um, the first question is uh, about the relationship between the unwholesome roots and the ashrava, the taints. Are they the same thing or are they different? There's three of each. Yeah. There's actually a difference in that maybe I could okay let's do it this way Okay, so we have three asavas. So we have the asava of sensual desire, craving for existence, and ignorance. Is this showing up on the screen? Yes. Okay. So these two asavas would come under the root of greed. So as you say that greed is what underlies these two asavas and ignorance is connected with, or even it's a mode of, or identical with the root of delusion. So these two go with greed. But hatred, the root of hatred, doesn't have a counterpart amongst the three asavas. And I could just speculate the reason for this is that the asavas, the way I understand it, I call them the primordial defilements that push the stream of consciousness forward through sangsara, through the round of existence. So they involve some element either of blindness, that's delusion or ignorance, and clinging or grasping, which is sensual desire and craving for existence. Whereas hatred doesn't have that binding effect, but it's, it's an unwholesome root. It's a root of other defilements and it generates unwholesome karma, but it doesn't have that binding or attaching function of the asavas. That's my understanding. Thank you, Bhante. That's very helpful. Then there's some questions about cheetahs, just to get clear what it means. Um, is a cheetah a state of mind? Could that be a one way of saying cheetah? I, I say that's a little bit misleading. I prefer to call it an act of mind. 
or an occasion of mind. Because state of mind, you could say the state of mind, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm worried, I'm, I'm, exp I'm anxious, I'm exhilarated. So those are states of mind, it's like different emotional states. But the citta is an act by which one experiences an object, but one experiences it together with a, these various associated mental factors, which maybe turn it in, into a state of mind. I see. Yeah. So the, the curiosity questions are, are the same thing. One is, are cheetahs and feelings different? And then there's a second one, are cheetahs and will different? Okay, those are good questions. Technically, feeling is a mental factor that accompanies the cheetahs. So chitta is the act of mind or the occasion of mind and accompanying each of those, any state of mind is a feeling, which can be a feeling of pleasant feeling, painful feeling, joyful feeling, um, joyful feeling, a feeling of displeasure or a neutral feeling. Yeah, so feeling technically in the sense of Vedana would be a feeling, a, a mental factor that accompanies a chitta. And then a will, technically I would say that will corresponds to a mental factor called in Pali chaitana, which I translate volition. So that is another mental factor, which we could call this the intentional or purposeful purposeful factor within the chitta. It's a factor that makes any chitta, gives it some purpose, some intention, some volition within the chitta. We're going to come to encounter these mental factors in tomorrow's session. Thank you, Bhante. And then um, why is prompting such an important mode of classification? It's an interesting question, and I don't actually know the answer to that. <laughs> I thought of that question myself, but it, it just seems that the those who formulated or constructed the Abhidharma system seem to give some importance to this distinction of whether a chitta is prompted or unprompted. Maybe that perhaps the reason is that the distinction of prompting and unprompting determines the karmic weight of the chitta, the karmic force. So if an unwholesome chitta is, occurs unprompted, I would assume it creates stronger negative karma than the same type of chitta that is prompted either by others or by oneself. And then the opposite with the wholesome chittas. And there is a, a chapter on karma later on, isn't there, in the text. Does that appear? Does it, does it make that distinction? Does it sort of tie up? No, it, it doesn't discuss the distinction of prompting and unprompting. Right. Um, then could you provide examples of the mental states based on someone practicing along the path? Is now you along the what? Uh, could you provide examples of a me the mental states of someone who's a practitioner who's practicing along the path? I think perhaps we're going to come to that when we come to the wholesome states of the wholesome chitras. Thank you, Bhante. Then the next one is a, a, an interesting one. Can you analyze schadenfreude, the unfortunate state where one takes joy in the pain of others in terms of cheetahs? Perhaps, perhaps it's possible to do, um, but I'm not going to try that now. <laughs> uh, then the next one is, is delusion always present? when there's a wrong view. Can you give some examples of delusion arising without greed or hatred accompanying it? Um, well, the two examples here would be the, the, or the two types of cheetahs would be the doubt. So when one is in this doubting consciousness or doubting frame of mind, one is uncertain say one encounters the Buddha, one has been practicing, say the Buddha's teaching, but then suddenly one falls into this doubt. Is it really true or just a lot of malaki that some ancient Indians have come up with? 
And then one starts to doubt whether the practice is really going to lead to the fruits that are promised. Yeah, so in that case, there's no greed, no hatred, but that would be a state dominated by doubt in which delusion is what's underlying that doubt. And then the purely restless consciousness, when the mind is just in a state of agitation, um, the restlessness, constant vacillating and fluctuating, but you know, that would be a case of delusion without greed or hatred. Thank you, Andy. that's helpful. Um, then we've got a question about feelings, Vedana. It says here, uh, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feelings. The form of cheetah that arises in connection to all events arising, I have understood in some suttas is not disappearing. This feeling tone or valence will always be there, but it's rather the hindrance it can lead to that it's transformed. Is this a correct understanding? I'm not sure that I understood the question. I think the idea is that the feeling tones will always be present. Yeah. It's the it's what they cause the hindrance they lead to that is transformed on the path. Yeah, so, of course, every, every chitta has an accompanying feeling, but there are many different ways of reacting to those feelings. You know, pleasant feelings can bring attachment or they can be accompanied by some degree of detachment. I think this will become clearer as we go along, particularly when we come to the wholesome chitas. Thank you, Bhante. Then a question here, um, do, do all worldly cheetahs arise due to clinging to self? Um, I don't know, actually. L let us say that not all worldly cheetahs are accompanied by an explicit view of self. Perhaps we could say that there's an implicit underlying grasping of the idea of self that underlies all unwholesome cheetahs, maybe Thank wholesome cheetahs, also maybe under a great deal of wholesome cheetahs. Thank you, Bhante. Should we go back to your... To your I think we, yeah, I think we have yeah. to get back. Okay, and then we'll the end. Okay. <coughs> okay, so now we're going to move into a new area now. And this is, I would say, a more difficult area than the unwholesome cheetahs. So these are called the rootless cheetahs, cheetahs that are not accompanied by roots. And before we come to this, I sort of have to prepare the way for this by giving a brief overview, very brief overview of the process, the orderly process or orderly sequence in the occurrence of cheetahs within an active process. And so I could, could only do this rather superficially here. Let me get the white. <coughs> How is the magnification here? It's good, Bhante. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay, so this is a com what's called a complete eye door process. So this is the actual cognitive process in which a visible object has impinged or manifested before the eyes. And so this will be the process involved in the initial cognizing of that object through the eye. So here we have the stream of the bhavanga flowing by then the object appears at number one, phase one, but a bhavanga flows by very quickly. Then when the object has struck on the eye door, the eye organ, a kind of vibration metaphorically, but disturbance takes place in the bhavanga. And at number three, the bhavanga is cut off. Then there arises one cheetah 
which has the function of turning to the eye door. This is called the five door inverting. Inverting means turning towards. So the function of this chitta is to turn to whichever sense door the object is appearing to. So if it were a sound, this chitta coming at the ear, this chitta would turn to the ear. If, say, somebody was cooking nearby and the odor of the food came to me, this chitta would turn to the nose. But in this case, we're taking a visible object appears. So this chitta turns to the eye door. Then there arises what is called an eye consciousness. The eye consciousness doesn't know anything. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very stupid consciousness. <laughs> it doesn't know anything about the object that's appearing. It's just like a camera. I happen to have the camera right next to me. <laughs> like the camera just takes the picture, but doesn't know what it's taking the picture of, but it just takes in the visible form. And so the eye consciousness just takes in the visible form of the object then the this is followed by another chitta, which in a sense receives the form appearing. Another chitta arises that investigates what is that form. The next chitta determines this is the form. And this is all taking place at this point at a preconceptual level, a very, very, a very subtle level, determining the nature of the form. Then there arise seven chitas in succession that are called javanas. There's no real good translation for this, in which one reacts to the object appearing at the eye door. And it's the javana chitas that create the karma. It's in this phase that the karma is created. And then if it's... If it's a prominent object, there will be two chitas that register the object. And then comes the, the, the stream of the bhavanga arises again. So this is a complete idor process. And it would be basically the same process if there was a sound, there would be an ear consciousness, if it were an odor, a nose consciousness, a taste, a tongue consciousness a bodily sensation, a body consciousness. So that's the complete eye-door process. Then there are processes that take place purely inwardly. These are called the mind-door processes. Okay, this is, yeah, so this is, um, We'll take it with a clear object appearing. This is without a, an outer sense object, but when an object comes, arises internally at the, what's called the mind door. So the bhavanga flows by, there comes the disturbance, this vibration of the bhavanga, the arrest or cutting off of the bhavanga. Then arises a chitta called mind door adverting, turning to the object appearing at the mind door and determining that object. And then there come the seven moments of the javana in which one reacts to the object, creating some karma in that process. Then come the two moments of registration. Okay, I'm bringing this in to provide a background for understanding the rootless chitas. And this is rather complicated, so please don't get discouraged. And, <laughs> and drop out from the program because of this. Okay, first in the result, the rootless cheetahs, we have unwholesome resultant cheetahs, of which there are seven. So we have eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness. And remember, this is just that one moment.
that one moment, fleeting moment, occurring after the bhavanga, after the five door adverting, that one moment of sensory consciousness. So it's either eye consciousness, ear, nose, tongue, or body consciousness. And the first four are accompanied by neutral feeling. It might seem to us, I see something beautiful and I feel joyful, or I see something disturbing and I feel upset and a pain. But that feeling of pleasure and pain does not occur in the eye consciousness itself, but it occurs at a later phase when we are sort of evaluating what appears to eye consciousness. But that one moment of eye consciousness, ear, nose, or tongue consciousness is always accompanied by the neutral feeling. But the unwholesome resultant body consciousness, consciousness that one moment that arises when there's some touch sensation at the body, if it's an unwholesome resultant, it's accompanied by a painful bodily feeling. Okay, then that sense consciousness, that moment of sense consciousness is followed by the receiving consciousness which is accompanied by the neutral feeling. And then the investigating consciousness also accompanied by the neutral feeling. So those are, un those are seven unwholesome resultant types of consciousness and they're all rootless. They don't have either good or bad roots. And it's said that the root is a factor that helps to establish stability or strength in a chitta. So those chittas that lack roots are weaker than the chittas that have roots. And so we have three groups of the rootless chittas, the unwholesome resultants, certain wholesome resultants, and certain types of functional chittas. And so those seven types of unwholesome resultants result from unwholesome karma. And so they're called unwholesome resultants. Them in themselves, they're not unwholesome, they're karmically neutral. But these chitas result from the ripening of unwholesome karma. And so they're called unwholesome resultants. So I've gone through them already. Okay, then we come to the wholesome resultant types of rootless consciousness of which there are eight. So the eight, we have the first five are the counterparts of the unwholesome resultants. But in this case, the un, you see, the unwholesome resultants arise when the object is disagreeable, a disagreeable form, disagreeable sound, disagreeable odor, disagreeable taste, or a disagreeable bodily sensation. The wholesome resultants arise when there is an agreeable object. So eye consciousness, ear, nose, tongue, consciousness, accompanied, all accompanied by neutral feeling and the bodily consciousness accompanied by the pleasant feeling. Then comes the receiving consciousness, a wholesome resultant accompanied by equanimity. And then two types of investigating consciousness. The normal one would be the investigating consciousness accompanied by equanimity if it's a normal agreeable object, but it's said that if it's, a, if it's an especially agreeable object, then the investigating consciousness is accompanied by a joyful feeling. <clears throat> so these are the eight wholesome resultant types 
of rootless consciousness. So you see we have seven unwholesome resultants, seven unwholesome resultants, five occurring through the senses, the receiving consciousness, and the investigating consciousness. And these occur when there is a disagreeable object. And when there's an agreeable or especially agreeable object, we have eight types of wholesome resultant rootless consciousness. Seven are the counterparts of the seven unwholesome resultants. And the additional one, you get a special bonus if you have some especially wholesome karma ripening with a very agreeable object then one gets that investigating consciousness accompanied by joy. So we have seven and eight resultants, rootless resultants. And then we have three types of functional rootless consciousness. Again, we go back to the diagram. So here we have the five door adverting consciousness that precedes the sensory consciousness, the eye consciousness. So this is in the sense, a complete eye door or process or process through any of the other physical senses. So the five door adverting, And then in the mind door, we have the mind door inverting consciousness. And so the rootless functional consciousness, one is that five sense door inverting consciousness, which is accompanied by the neutral feeling Another is the mind door adverting consciousness, also accompanied by a neutral feeling. And then the third functional consciousness, and this one has always been something of a puzzle to me. I've never really fully understood it. It's called the smile producing consciousness accompanied by joy. And this needs a little explanation. Okay, so let's go to the notes. Okay, so first, the word that's translated as functional is kiriya, which is used to indicate that these types of chittas simply perform certain tasks that don't have any karmic potency. So they neither create karma, nor are they results of karma. And so we have the five sense door adverting consciousness, which simply turns to the sense door whenever an object appears at any of the five sense doors. And then the mind door adverting consciousness, which can occur in the mind door as the mind door adverting consciousness, but the same type of consciousness can occur in a sensory process through the five sense doors, and then it is called the determining consciousness. This could be a little confusing, but we have to understand that sometimes the same type of chitta can perform different functions, several functions. In this case, this one chitta can perform these two functions. At the mind door, it turns to the object present at the mind door. And at the sense door, it determines the nature of the object appearing at the sense door. So these are two functional cheetahs. Okay, the smile producing consciousness, 
This is said, said to be a chitta that's peculiar to arahants, including Buddhas and Pacheka Buddhas. And his function is said to cause arahats to smile about sense sphere phenomena. Yeah, don't ask me to elaborate on this. I've never really figured it out. <laughs> After 40 years of studying, I've never figured it out. <laughs> but there must be some reason for that explanation, for the, of some reason for including that type of cheetah here. But normally, when in our hot smiles, it will be by one of the beautiful sense sphere functional cheetahs, which we'll come to later today. Okay, maybe we could use now the rest of this period to take questions. Since we have just like 10 minutes left in the session. Thank you, Bhante. I'll pass it on to Richard again. Yes, Bhante. So, um, thank you. Uh, okay, there's a few questions to ask. So, could you give an example of an unprompted consciousness arising? Okay, since we've so far we've covered only the unwholesome types of consciousness. So, I mean, I thought that I gave some examples already, but anyway, I'll just do it again. So we, the unprompted consciousness accompanied by greed. Again, the thought of eating some ice cream comes into the mind and without any inducement by others, without having to persuade myself, I just go down to the freezer and take out a box of ice cream and scoop it out and start eating as much as I want. So that would be an unprompt, those would be, what motivates me to go down to the refrigerator and take out the box of ice cream, that would be an unprompted cheetah accompanied by greed. Um, and then, okay, I see a person that I have some negative feelings towards and that person walks into the room. And so just spontaneously, without any kind of effort on the part of others or myself, as soon as I see that person, states of aversion or hatred arise in the mind. So that would be unprompted cheetahs arising accompanied by hatred. Okay, and then, for prompted cheetahs, again, using the example of ice cream. Somebody says, come, let's go get some ice cream. And I say, nah, I'm enjoying myself here. And they say, come, don't be a killjoy. Everybody wants you to come. Okay, so then they persuade me and convince me to go along. So then I go along a little bit, a little bit, reluctantly, but still I'm motivated by the greed for the ice cream. So that would be an unprompted cheetah, um, unprompted cheetah accompanied by greed. And then I see a person who either I have neutral feelings towards or I even like the person, but somebody starts whispering in my ear, you know what that guy was telling, was writing about you on Facebook? He was really putting you down, criticizing you, ridiculing you. You're not going to take that, are you? Okay, so then because of the persuasion by that other person, then I start to feel resentment and anger towards that person who's come into the room. So those would be states of hatred accompanied by aversion. By, uh, those are states of hatred that have been prompted. Thank you, Bhante. Then a second question, when the Buddha refers to the mind as luminous, what, which cheetah is he referring to? It seems that he's making that, I would say a universal statement about the nature of the mind itself. That I would say maybe it's the inherent nature of the mind to be luminous in that the function of the mind is to illuminate 
the objective field. But what's interesting is that that word that's translated as luminous, pabasara, comes, usually it comes in descriptions of the fourth jhanic state. So it seems that it, we could say that in the fourth jhana, or maybe as one is going through the jhanas, that inherent luminosity of the mind becomes more and more manifest. Whereas in the unwholesome states of mind, the unwholesome cheetahs, the luminosity of the mind is pretty much like clouded over by the dark emotions. And even in the ordinary wholesome states of mind, though the luminosity is starting to appear, but it's a little bit like there are several layers of clouds that are obscuring the sun because they're still obscuring the luminosity. Thank you, Banti. That's, that's very helpful. Um, a third question, um, forgive me, it's all on my screen. Can you teach us a method for remembering the 121 cheetahs for study purposes? <laughs> Just look at the list. <laughs> I don't know any secret, except to, to learn them by the classes, by the categories and classes. The fourth question, from the point of view of practice, how does one know that delusion is arising? It seems like the very nature of delusion is, the, is that knowing is clearly impeded. You know, what's interesting is that even in the Satipatthana method, in that passage that I quoted before from the Satipatthana Sutta, he understands a mind connected with delusion as a mind connected with delusion. So it would seem that at the moment when one recognizes that the mind is covered by delusion, at that moment, when the mind is not actually accompanied by delusion, but one is reflecting back on a moment of mind that is just past in which delusion was present. And so now a state of mind accompanied by knowledge, by mindfulness and by knowledge has arisen, perceiving that there has just arisen previously a state of mind accompanied by delusion. And so I say to the extent that one maintains consistency of mindfulness and clear comprehension of the state of mind within that period, then delusion doesn't have a chance to intrude. But when the mindfulness and clear comprehension become weaker and fade out, then delusion has the opportunity to arise. Thank you, Bhante. That's very helpful. Um, then a question about the... Um, uh, about... That schema you, you showed us. How does yeah. the adverting cheetah know which sense door to advert to? And how does the investigating cheetah know how to investigate? Is there any analysis of this knowing? Okay, let me use an example that I've sometimes <clears throat> that I've sometimes used when I'm giving the Abhidhamma teaching in the hall, the lecture hall at the monastery. There are five doors to that lecture hall. One, two, three, four, five. And somebody comes to one door and knocks. <laughs> so somebody comes to one door and knocks. So when you're inside the hall, you know where the knock is coming from. And so you can go to that door and open the door. <laughs> and so the five door adverting consciousness will somehow know at which sense door an object is knocking and turn to that sense door. It doesn't have to stop to think about it, but it just is sort of automatically directed towards that sense door. So that's with the five door adverting consciousness. And then the other question? The, uh, the, other, the other one is the um, investigating cheetah. Know how to investigate. At what basis is it investigating? It's just, its function is just momentarily just to look to see what is the object that's appearing. So is there, is there, is there in the commentary any reference to labeling? Like you see? Yeah. Are things like conceptual formation, labeling, classification, all of that comes much later in the sequence of, of, 
of cognitive processes. So there's a rather complex su succession of cognitive processes by which initially the object is just maybe perceived in its bare immediacy. Then it's gradually, it's sort of integrated into one's framework of conceptualization and interpretation and understanding. And so the labeling will come considerably later in a sequence of cognitive processes. And by later, I mean within, still within a split second, but <laughs> later within that split second than the initial occasion of presentational immediacy. And there's one last question here. Yeah. Um, it, the difference between the cheetahs and the javanas, who is the one in the javanas who reacts to the cheetahs and makes karma? The sort of implicit idea that there's some karma making process that happens. Yeah, there's no buddy, there's no one there. It's just that the javanas occur as a sequence <laughs> of seven cheetahs responding to the object. And it's those cheetahs that create the comma, depending upon how they react to the object. It's pretty much within that phase that one can let's say, transform one's response to the object. For example, if a disagreeable object appears, if one attends to that object in an unskillful way, and that would be probably the function of the might of the determining consciousness. So if one responds to the object in an unskillful way to a disagreeable object, then one re will respond with aversion, with hatred towards the object. But if one attends to the object in a skillful way, then instead of reacting to the disagreeable object with aversion, one could respond with equanimity or with a balanced state of mind, just accepting the object or accepting the experience and not letting it disturb the mind or even respond in a more skillful way. So sort of to transform the nature of one's responses to those disagreeable objects. And similarly with agreeable objects, if one attends unskillfully, then there will arise craving and grasping and clinging to the pleasant object. Whereas if one responds skillfully, then one could respond with, again, with equanimity towards the agreeable object. Dear Spanty, just if I could just ask you to clarify a bit more, because it appears that when you, you when you say one can modify one's behavior, the one you're yeah. referring to there is a causal agent. Yeah, he's that's separate it, from the cheetahs. Okay, yeah, he's it's actually it, yeah, it's occurring within the cheetahs. So when I speak, I sort of have to resort to our usual what we call a conventional way of speaking. But this is these are things that occur within the cheetahs themselves. Probably so, one would say that it's the function of volition. So is there is there within the Javanas a volitional cheetah element somewhere that comes yeah, in? Yeah, the, the volition is very prominent within the Javana. Ah, okay, thank you, Dante. Um, then just one more, we ought to break for lunch. Um, uh, in the schema of the complete idol process, where is Vedana's feeling? Yeah, the feeling occurs, uh, a feeling accompanies every cheetah. Okay, thank you. Um, and maybe just one more question. Is it correct that at the very first I door process, yeah. because there's no identification, no karma gets created? Yeah, this is something problematic. They say that the Javana always creates karma, but I find it, I myself find it difficult to understand how if there is at, at this stage, just the presentational immediacy of the, uh, a presentation, the, an immediate presentation of the object without a clear labeling or conceptual processing of the object, how one could create karma. I don't know. And I find this to be something problematic within the, the, the Abhidhamma system. I have to say, I don't find the Abhidhamma system to be 
free of problems. <laughs> and there, there are some problems, conceptual <laughs> problems that I could see within it. And that's one of them. <laughs> and perhaps, Bounty, while you've got the, the, the scheme open, there's a question here, which is, could you review the scheme again? Could you just put the scheme back on the screen? Um, the actual, I think it's just one above, isn't it? I, uh, no, the, the one with the full the idea. Flow, the, yeah, the flow of cheetahs in the in in the in perception. Yeah. They're this, yeah, because someone someone lost their zoom as you were displaying it. Thank you, Bante. Yeah. 